Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this live hangout. I am joined by Professor Salvatore Babonis, who is an associate professor of sociology and social policy at the University of Sydney, Australia. Okay, so uh, which, of course, he's got an interesting story, which we'll ha perhaps we'll hear. Uh, you know, so Salvatore, you are not uh, you are not a native Australian. Am I correct about that? Uh, tell the audience Hi. a little bit about yourself. Yeah, I am not a native Australian, as you can hear right away. I'm a, an American born in Passaic, New Jersey, uh, educated at the University of Montevallo in Alabama and Johns Hopkins in Baltimore. And uh, I've been out here for 10 years. So it's been beautiful. Good afternoon, by the way, from uh, Sydney, Australia, where if we were to turn around the computer, I could show you a sunny view of the Sydney Opera House. Maybe if we get bored talking about the book, we can see the Opera House uh, you know, later in the broadcast. Yeah, that's kind of tempting. I actually want to get uh, get kind of bored with the book, but that's going to be difficult. OK, so uh, Salvatore has sent me a copy of this book, The New Authoritarianism, and uh, I've got a link on the uh, in the video description. So if you want to check this out on Amazon, uh, you can check it out there. And what's interesting about this book is it's saying something different than a lot of other people are saying, which, of course, that makes sense, given some of the uh, some of the premises in in the book because we've heard a lot about authoritarianism with the rise of Donald Trump and I know that uh, you know Timothy Snyder from Yale and other scholars have pointed out you know different parallels between the rise of Trump and the rise of totalitarian dictators and we've heard a lot about that and why the election of Donald Trump uh, should make people afraid of the rise of a new authoritarianism but that's not what I'm seeing in this book. Now, what I'm seeing here is that there is an authoritarianism, but it's not Donald Trump. Uh, Salvatore, uh, let, get, give us the premise well, of your book here. Well, you just have to get to the subtitle, which is Trump, Populism, and the Tyranny of Experts. Look, Tom, you can't be an authoritarian when the only authority you respect is yourself <laughs> the whole the whole basis of authoritarianism is the idea that you govern with reference to authorities you tell people don't think for yourself let the church think for you let the universities think for you uh, you know german authoritarianism of the 19th and early 20th centuries was at first based on deference to lutheranism was later based on deference to universities to professors to teachers to people like us it was not based on people thinking for themselves, getting on the internet, believing what they want to believe. You know, Trump is completely anti-authoritarian. Every authority in America, I mean, rattle off the authorities in America, the universities, the military, the intelligence services, the mainline Protestant churches, uh, you know, all of them have been extraordinarily anti-Trump. You know, the media, uh, you know, everyone except Fox News, and sometimes, even Fox News uh, are anti-Trump. It's hard to find any authority figure in America who is pro-Trump. Uh, in fact, they actually call it uh, Trump's administration. Uh, you know, the the administration of that all the adults have left the building now that Trump is in the White House, right? So there's nothing authoritarian at all about Donald Trump. Now, if you want to call him autocratic, maybe that's correct. Uh, if you want to call him you know, self-willed, entrepreneurial, but, you know, authoritarianism doesn't just generically mean bad. You know, there, there are lots of things in the world that are bad that are not authoritarian, and there are lots of things that are authoritarian that might be good. You know, authoritarianism in chemistry means you listen to the teacher, you follow the rules, you, you know, you put on those glasses because the authoritarian teacher told you whenever you're mixing chemicals, you got to wear the glasses. That's authoritarianism. And sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad, but either way, it is definitely not Donald Trump. Okay. And in a, yeah, and, and really when you look at, at Trump, it's like, you know, not listening to these various, uh, to these various authorities and really a rejection of right. a lot of the, uh, you know, of the elite wisdom that, uh, that we've seen now, of course, in a chemistry classroom, in a lot of cases, yeah, whatever that chemistry teacher is telling you to do, you might want to go ahead and do that. <laughs> like I've never uh, thought about the chemistry classroom as a laboratory for, 
independent thinking or something no, like that. That's that 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 not what we want. Yeah, that could get very, uh, you know, that that could get very dangerous. OK, but then again, see, this is something that I as a teacher in humanities, I've seen mm -hmm. some things, you know, some attempts, it seems to align, uh, you know, curricula like to basically make right. the history curriculum a lot more like you would find in a science classroom or something like that. Uh, you know, for example, I teach uh, AP European history, AP US history. And a few years back, those courses were redesigned. Now, in the, uh, you know, under the old exam, it was, you know, all of the rubrics were, you know, they were flexible. Like if, if an essay was weak in this area, it could, it could compensate by being strong here. And so you'd be great. You'd be scoring the essay really more as a whole. And there right. was room to see that like, you know what, this one's kind of outside the box, but it's kind of brilliant. Um, whereas yeah. this one might be in the box, but it's not that great. Uh, whereas yeah. now, you know, they're scored with with checklist and it must have this, it must have this. Right. If it has something that's not on the checklist, it, it doesn't really help yeah. anything. And it's funny and, you should bring, it, oh, it's funny you should bring up education because authoritarianism really arose as a word to describe a form of education. I mean, the first use of authoritarianism in the world was actually used to describe authoritarian religions. And it was used by American spiritualists who believed in seances and raising the dead and all this to, to criticize authoritarian religion, religion you know, of the Bible. <laughs> and, but it quickly spread to education, where authoritarian education was the kind of education we had in the 19th century where teachers recited something and students had to recite it back. And you had to learn exactly what the teacher said, the authoritarian classroom. And the original anti-authoritarians were exactly those who wanted independent thinking, the progressive education movement of the late 19th and early 20th century, the people like John Dewey, who you've heard of in education theory, who wanted to open up the classroom and have students explore for themselves. I don't know if you've ever come across the Quincy experiment. Uh, the Quincy experiment in Quincy, Massachusetts was the beginning of the American uh, progressive education movement. The idea that students should be you know, reading real books, not reading from packaged readers, that students should be thinking for themselves, writing essays of, of their own, on their own topics, with their own imagination. Uh, and that's really where the difference between authoritarianism and progressivism came about. You know, you mentioned, you know, that my own political background is, you know, not particularly Republican. Uh, my last book, in fact, was subtitled, was 16 for 16, A Progressive Agenda for a Better America. Yeah, I come very out, much out of this progressive movement. But progressives, once upon a time, really believed in people thinking for themselves. You know, when I heard Donald Trump's inaugural address, which everyone compared to Hitler and Nuremberg rallies, that's when I sat down and wrote this book. Because when I heard Donald Trump's inaugural address, I heard William Jennings Bryan. And I know, as a history teacher, you've got to love William Jennings Bryan. And the Silver Crusade. The, do, do you want to tell the lecture on 1896 or should I give them the lecture on 1896? Yeah, you know, it'd be interesting to hear what you have to say there because because it is and, and it kind of echoes some of the things that you've said here about populism. OK, because you're talking about how, you know, it's like authoritarians appeal to expertise and experts and all of that kind of stuff. And then populists com appeal to uh, conventional common sense, as you call right. it. And right. so now the thing is, uh, you know, if you I mean, populism is not a goal and, and that's not anything I get from this book that Donald Trump is any sort of savior or anything like that. Uh, you know what you have referred to him like your last chapter is called the populist purgative, that it's yeah. just populism. And of course, your background is in sociology and the way that right. humans interact with each other. And so what I'm seeing here is not that like, you know, Donald Trump is where we're, you know, what what the country needs for the long term. Term, but something, you know, like when you listen to his inaugural address where he talks about this is the day that the government was returned to the people. Absolutely right. And, and what you're seeing there is, and of course, people can, you know, depending on 
the lens that people are looking at that uh, through. They're going to get whatever they're going to get out of that. But as far as that goes, when you hear him say that, there were a lot of people, and I think there still are a lot of people in the United States who feel alienated from their government. And right. when you That's were talking, you know, you were mentioning how when Abraham Lincoln, you know, in the Gettysburg Address, said government of the people, for the people, by the people, that this means all of the people. And so right. what, what we've seen right. here in the United States recently is people see that, the, or at least they perceive that the government is serving some people and leaving others behind, which is exactly when you go back to William Jennings Bryan, uh, these farmers in the United States. Now, when I re read the populist platform, I look at some of that stuff and it's like they wanted <laughs> government ownership of all of the railroads. Uh, you got it. Yeah. Like, do you not think that the rich people can manipulate the government and all that kind of stuff? But the thing is, there things like the secret ballot uh direct yeah. election of senators there are some things in their platform that ended up uh, becoming tax. part of our cultural tradition so when it comes down to it even though these people may have been a bit uh fringe and maybe a bit short-sighted or nearsighted uh it it definitely got people's attention that the government is yeah. ignoring a very large group of people and people who in the previous generation had formed the backbone of America. Right. No, populism, as I call it, is the biblical flood that washes away the sins of the expert class. And it happened in 1896, just like it happened in 2016. Remember, populists usually don't win. Trump only squeaked by, right? Uh, Bernie Sanders didn't win in the Democratic Party. What they do is they change the terms of the debate. In 1896, William Jennings Bryan, didn't win. William McKinley won. But the entire American expert class united against William Jennings Bryan. They said it was crazy to go off the gold standard. Well, what happened to the gold standard? It caused the Great Depression. And then we finally went off the gold standard. Uh, you know, William Jennings Bryan wanted uh, regulation of the railroads. Well, they said that was, you know, impossible and you can't stop capitalism. But what did we get? We got the federal, uh, the Railway Commission, and eventually the, the Federal Transportation Commission, which regulated the railway rates, right? We got the income tax. We got direct selection of senators. We got the populist program, even though the populists lost the election, right? They changed the terms of the debate. And I think that's what's going to happen now, post-2016, is that, you know, Trump may or may not get impeached. He may or may not get convicted if he does get compete, impeached. He may or may not win the election in 2020. But for the next 20 or 30 years, the terms of American political debate are going to be entirely different. You'll no longer be able to say, well, I was endorsed by the New York Times. That's why you should vote for me. That's not going to cut it anymore. And so that idea that you should, yeah, because because that's the thing. And I think that the Clinton campaign was very much into that kind. You know, it's like all of the experts say that I'm right. more qualified. Now, you know, it's it's interesting thinking about like, I mean, one of the things that I really uh, that was really thought provoking about this book, okay, because there's a lot more to this than than Trump or the Trump phenomenon uh, in terms of the bigger picture here. And you've mentioned this this whole idea of independent thinking versus versus critical thinking critical. skills, as they're called. Right. Uh, you know, tell me a little bit more about this distinction you're seeing, and, and certainly I can chime in as well, but I think that what you have to say here really speaks to the current state of American education. Right. You know, most, most educators, I know a lot of the people who listen to you are also teachers, and you know, I'm a teacher also at the university level. Uh, most of us are unaware of where our teaching comes from. Uh, before the 1880s, most teaching in America, as in Europe and most of the world, was what you would imagine in a rural Chinese classroom today. Teacher stands up in front, says something, students repeat it back. Recite, you know, repeat and re recite and repeat, recite and repeat over and over, memorizing passages that you then had to stand up and, and repeat. Uh, the progressive event education movement in America did away with all that. Right? And we had instead student-centered education. The problem is we had two different wings of the progressive education movement. You had the pedagogical progressives who wanted progressive pedagogy where students should be reading you know, real uh, books. Students should be writing essays about their own experiences. Students should learn how to interact with the real world. And those of you who are into education theory would think of Thomas Dewey uh, as uh, the key, you know, uh, as the key uh, pedagogical progressive. But then there was also a set of administrative progressives 
And administrative progressivism in education brought us the system of academic majors. It brought us standardized testing. Lester Ward is the person most commonly associated with administrative progressivism. And to some extent, this was a Columbia versus Yale thing. Uh, Columbia and Dewey, Columbia, Chicago, were these uh, pedagogical progressives versus the uh, Yale, Harvard crowd of the administrative progressives. Now, what those two threads got us in education were the two things we have today, which is, you know, on one hand, an emphasis on student-centered education. We should be making sure each student, you know, grapples with the material for herself or himself and comes to his or her own viewpoints and thinks in an independent way. That independent thinking is very much the pedagogical progressive tradition. But there's also an administrative progressive tradition, which is all about testing, which is about teaching to tests, you know, measurement, uh, which is about you know, having larger classes and standardized formats. Um, and that's produced what we call the critical thinking skill. And a lot of people misunderstand the word critical thinking. They think critical thinking has got to be good because it's critical. Like, no, no, critical thinking is not about criticizing people. Critical thinking is learning how to apply disciplinary knowledge to disciplinary problems. And a subject like chemistry, we brought up chemistry earlier, that's entirely appropriate. I mean, the student should learn from 400 years of chemical research, how to apply the principles of chemistry, the periodic table, you know, how to do experiments in the way the teacher says, you know, the te you should learn how to use the tools of the discipline to attack the problem of the discipline. But in disciplines like history, sociology, English, that's not what we want. We don't want our students learning how to apply our thinking to their problems. We want students thinking up their own problems. We want students thinking for themselves. We're not teaching historians and sociologists, we're teaching citizens. You know, your job, Tom Ritchie, is not to turn out young historians. Your job is to turn out young citizens. And that's the problem we have, is that this you know, independent thinking approach is becoming squeezed and squeezed. The supremacy of the sciences and science models has really taken over universities to the extent that we want humanities people to be just like scientists. You know, publish short papers uh, on empirical topics, that no one's going to read, uh, you know, instead of wanting our humanity scholars to think broadly, to publish books, honestly, like this. This book will get me zero credit in the academy. And the reason is no academic references, no engagement with literature, no empirical data. It's a book of ideas. And books of ideas are no longer counted in the university world. We don't want independent thinking anymore. More and more in the humanities, what we want is critical thinking. And that's a problem. You know, administrators love it. You know, critical thinking is, is the, the way administrators want you to act. They give you a list of specific tools you're supposed to apply in your classroom, and you've got to apply those tools one by one to get to the appropriate solution. Well, that's the critical thinking approach to education, the administrative approach to education. I very much embrace, especially in the humanities, uh, the pedagogically progressive approach, independent thinking. Let students think for themselves. Okay, and and yeah, that's that's interesting that uh, you know because one of the things that you get into in your book is the evolution of liberalism and just the the sense that we can't even really agree on what liberalism is anymore. What are the principles? Right. Right? Now, if you go to Europe, it's a little bit different, but in the United States, certainly liberalism has ceased to mean anything. And then also progressivism, that you've got these two facets, because I've often, when I think about progressive education, uh, it tends to be something that I'm not very fond of because I think about this administrative progressivism. I think right. in terms of like Frederick Taylor, scientific management, like right. it's just very, like right. when you look at the the current curriculum in uh, AP courses that it's right. very very regimented to the point progressivism that, all the way yeah and and That's so what you, what you what you see here is you know that they need to write the essay this way they need right. to uh, have these understandings they need to be able to answer yeah. these questions and so you don't get to where like a student can uh, think independently about something and of course you see where especially when it comes to you know one of my Top, one of the topics I'm very passionate about is the American Civil War. And right. I, you know, I always tell my students that like, look, this is this is where, you know, this may be where I'm coming from or something like that, but this is really your thing to decide, like to, to look around right. and see, you know, how complex do you think this is? What was this about? This is really for you. But then, you know, you start to see where, you know, it's like if somebody says that, 
you know, the Civil War, like the big thing right now, of course, in the Academy is just, you know, the Civil War was about slavery and right. any other cause of the Civil War is like just takes a I mean, I wouldn't even say a back burner that it's just basically this is what the Civil War was about. And any other cause is really not worth talking about. And, I mean, and you know, I, I feel like and I've said before that, you know, I feel like if this continues, if, if we continue to look at historical questions as closed questions, rather than open questions that eventually people are going to think, why do I even need to learn history? Like if there's no like back and forth, if everything's a closed question, if the experts have circled the wagons and, you know, you're just, uh, you know, really most people who like history are just regular, well-read people. Like it's it's really something like the people that I enjoy talking to, uh, you know, are people who are just generally well-read. They've done a lot of independent research and I learn a lot from those people. But I don't know that given the constraints that I'm under as a teacher in our current system, that I'm training people, like you said, I mean, I'm not you know, very few of my students, if any, are going to become professional historians or sociologists. Yeah. But what am I doing as a teacher to really uh, get kids interested into like, hey, this could be something that I dabble in for life. And our current system, I don't think that it's setting setting up for that. And in a democracy, we need that kind of independent thinking. We need students to think for themselves because someday they're not going to be in your classroom, Tom Ritchie. Someday they're going to be out there in the world thinking whatever the hell they want, right? And no one's going to tell them what to think. And when they're out there, we need them to be able to think for themselves, to think you know, what they believe, not what their teachers would have had them believe way back when. We need them to have good judgment uh, that they can apply on their own, right? And that's why in a discipline like history, you know, students don't want to take history in your class, or maybe in your class they do, but students don't want to take history in school, they don't like the subject in universities, they no longer enroll in history, but go to any bookstore, will you find a chemistry section, a physics section, a sociology section? No, half the bookstore is history. People love history. They just don't love the way you're forced to teach history these days. Right? His history is an enormously popular subject. But what people want is to be able to pick and choose and to read who they please and to read the subjects they want and to think about them in the ways they want. I mean, take, I, I know you're very passionate about the whole Confederate Monuments debate. Take the Confederate Monuments debate. You know, people need to you know, embrace what they want to feel about a monument, about a, a statue, and their legitimate differences of opinion. When you tell people in an authoritarian way there's only one opinion you're allowed to have, people will just rebel. And in a democracy, you can't stop them from rebelling. And that's the beauty of democracy, is no matter how authoritarian the experts get, people can always kick them out of office. And that's what they did in 2016 with Donald Trump. That's what they almost did in 1896 with William Jennings Bryan. You know, we have the power, you know, the people, and I shouldn't even say we, because I'm one of the experts. You know, the people have the power, ultimately, to have their say in a democracy. You know, and you can't keep them down forever. You know, populism will eventually wipe away these expert opinions that are trying to restrict what they want to think. I mean, it, democracy requires that we respect everybody's point of view. You have to. I mean, are you not going, let's, let's assume, let's, let's even think for a minute that people who want a Robert E. Lee statue in their town square Imagine that they're racist white supremacists. I'm not saying they are. I'm saying imagine that they are. Are you going to let them vote? Because if you're going to let them vote, you've got to respect their viewpoint. Right? And so it's something very challenging I tell people, forget whether the monument is racist or not. Even if it is racist, those people who want it are citizens too. Right? Are we going to start saying that you can only vote if you have the right opinion, if you have an IQ over 120, if you finish university, if you have a certain income, if you own property, I mean, you know, that's the past, right? Everyone gets a vote today. And since everyone gets a vote, we have to respect all points of view. We don't have to agree with them. I don't agree with racists, but I don't want to kill them. I don't want to exile them. I don't want to put them in jail. I don't want to take away their right to vote, which means I've got to hear their opinions. And then I disagree with them. 
Okay, and sir, what we're hearing is like just a very, uh, you know, classical liberal uh, sort of uh, sort of mindset in terms of these people are part of the body politic. And I think if we just move it over a little bit, uh, you know, not uh, you know discuss, you know, not people who are uh, you know people that we all agree. Okay, these people are racist. They're out there. Um, but when you you know you mention uh, Trump and uh, you know Orban and uh, you know, in Europe and yeah, some yeah. of these other, uh, you know, leaders who've actually, you know, I think that that true racists make up a very small percentage of the American right. population. Right. But when you think about like whether it's here or whether it's in Romania or Austria, uh, you know, in some of these countries or France where, you know, you, you have a a president who's really part of the expert class, but a sizable part of the population, uh, you know, who has embraced, uh, you know, anti-immigration uh, nationalism. That in a lot of cases, they're they're not, uh, you know, the these people are elected by you know in a valid in a valid constitutional election and that result is dismissed and the people who voted for these people are ridiculed rather than being heard like you know one thing that i think about is emmanuel macron's uh, armistice day speech you know it was just like now every time that you know trump politicizes something uh, he's called out in the media for oh he went and politicized this and this but you know macron took uh, you know went to, to this Armistice Day speech and had all of these world leaders around. And he was, you know, it was an international, uh, you know, day of mourning. And he turned right. it into a political speech that was aimed at people who have disagreements with the expert class that says that, like, look, you shouldn't be concerned about immigration uh, because the experts say that there's no problem. And so you can see why I think Macron's uh, popularity right now is like less than 20%. I mean, well, certainly less than 30. Worse, uh, lower than lower than Trump's. <laughs> yeah. And, and so and the thing yeah, is yeah. that it's just I don't think there's really anybody that he and his people are listening to um, that right. it's the same. You know, he was running as like, oh, I'm this independent person, da, 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 da. And then he gets in there and totally part of the establishment. And nobody's wanting to say, hey, you know, these people are being elected. Maybe we should. Uh, you know, go, you know, maybe we should at least listen to what they have to say. One thing that you said in your book here that I thought was interesting, uh, if I can find it, I can read it uh, verbatim. But you uh, mentioned how liberals, they extol the principles of democracy, you know, like they all say that I believe in democracy. But then, yeah, here we go. Liberalism stands for the expansion of rights of all kinds. And in democratic countries, liberals have consistently fought to expand voting rights. But that doesn't mean that liberals always support democracy as such. So what we see here is that, oh, yes, democracy is great. Democratic elections are, you know, are the way to go. But then when those results don't come in the way that they want, then that's just those people aren't even right. worthy of consideration. Look, when, when Hillary Clinton said that 20% of the American population were racist, xenophobes, deplorables, you know, half of Trump's voters, uh, that was when she lost the election. Because you can't be a Democrat, capital D Democratic Party or little d believe in democracy, if you think that 20% of the electorate are undesirables who you'd be unwilling to associate with. Right. I mean, if you want to be a politician, you have to kiss all the babies, you know, red and yellow, black and white. <laughs> they're, they're all, you know, they're all precious, uh, all, you know, all the babies of the world. And you can't be saying that 20 percent of the community just doesn't belong in the country. You know, whether they're racist or not. I, I mean, that's what I really want to push, you know, teachers who are listening out there. People are, you know, that I, I'm not a racist. You're not a racist. But the term racist has become such a way to just exile people from the political community that we have to remember, you know, racists get to vote too. And if we live in a world in which racists get to vote, we have to have toleration. We have to have a space for public debate. We have to have a space for educating racists that they shouldn't be. You know, we have to be able to have a conversation about a Confederate monument without everybody who's opposed to, everyone who wants it, simply being called racist, you're not allowed to talk. Let the racists talk, and then let's disagree with them. 
right? And we need a plurality of views in the public space in order to run a proper democracy. You can't close down debate because if you close down debate, you can't have an election, you can't run, you, you simply can't run a democracy without a free and open debate. That's why we have the First Amendment. And the First Amendment is not just freedom of speech, you know, it's freedom of speech, freedom of press, freedom of religion, crucially, you know, freedom to congregate, right? freedom to meet and talk to other people. Um, you know, even the racists have those rights, even the sexists, even the homophobes, you know, even the the vilest people in the world. I, you know, I travel a lot in Europe, and Europeans tell me, "Oh, we're, you know, we're completely democratic and free here in Europe." And I say, "You know, you outlaw the Nazi Party." And they say, "Oh, yes, of course, they're Nazis." I said, "You know, in America, if you want to be a Nazi, you go right ahead and be a Nazi. In America, you want to walk through the streets with a Nazi flag, you go right ahead. And you know what? We'll all ignore you. Yeah, you know, we'll all tell you you're wrong." But if you want to, that's your right in America, because we do believe in freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, freedom of conscience in America. You know, and when it comes to talking about our public monuments, you know, Stonewall Jackson or Robert E. Lee, you know, yes, there's some racists who want a Stonewall Jackson monument, but there are also lots of non-racists who want a Stonewall Jackson monument. And you know what? There are lots of racists who want to tear down that Stonewall Jackson monument because they're anti-white, you know, because they're racist in a different way. You know, we just need to be able to have all of our voices in a public debate. And if even, and I want to really push you guys here, if even racists are allowed to have a viewpoint, a website, to podcast, you know, to reach an audience, to be on Facebook and Twitter, if even racists are allowed to, then certainly the rest of us are all allowed to, right? The idea that you should be clamping down on viewpoints just because you disagree with them, that's what's authoritarian. Authoritarianism is not that you, you know, want a Trump tax cut or you want higher tariffs on China. Uh, authoritarianism is telling people what to believe. That's what authoritarianism is. Donald Trump does very little of that. You know, the people who are out wanting to preserve their monuments in the South, they do very little telling people what to believe. Mm -hmm. The authoritarians are the people telling people what to believe. OK, so that was the thing like in the wake of Charlottesville, for example, like uh, President Trump took a lot of heat because he didn't, uh, you know, come down very firmly on one side and right. say that, you know, because the expert class was saying, even though when you look at the whole story there, it's just the people who I mean, and of course, I'm going to I mean, just my personal viewpoint. Uh, I don't I think that there were a lot of people at that rally who weren't racist. But I right. also, you know, when I was looking at the the speaker's bill for the rally, I decided for myself, I said, I don't want to, I don't want to be a part of that because yeah. these people are racist. Like the people, I mean, this Richard Spencer guy is from Boston, you know, it's like, what, what the hell does he care <laughs> about a Confederate monument? You know, that he's just, he's using my cultural heritage in order to promote his agenda. Right. And right. I think, I think the guy's disgusting, but at the same time, the guy had a permit to protest, I mean, or to assemble. Like, I mean, the thing is, they had a they had a permit to assemble. They went through all of the, you know, all of the ins and outs, and they went over there. And so, you know, you look at classical American liberalism that, you know, really, okay, they've got a permit. They're going to go out there and they're going to do their thing, and we're going to ignore them. But that's right. not how things are functioning right now, that that's where this authoritarianism you're talking about kicks in, that because this group that has, uh, you know, some views that are outside of the mainstream gets together, uh, counter protesters have to be there. The media has to be there. Uh, these people have to be harassed because, you know, you look at Antifa and some of these other groups well, that we Antifa, be racist. I, I'm sorry to interrupt, Tom. The oh, yeah. only the only truly fascist group in America today are the Antifa groups. <laughs> the supreme irony of irony. But if you're out there trying to beat up people for expressing their opinions, and you're organized in a militant group who are you know, well organized, who are you know, marching in a straight line, you know, who are armed and ready to beat down people who, who you disagree with, those are the only fascists, the Antifa protesters I, I hesitate to even call them protesters. The Antifa fascists are the only people in America who are employing fascist tactics. I mean, as someone who's actually studied fascism, <laughs> yeah, I can say that fascism is not whatever you don't like. Fascism is people organizing to suppress opposition using violence. 
You know, that's what the fascists did, whether it's in Italy, in Spain, in Germany, in Portugal. You know, that's the fascist way to go. And well, that's not what the rest of us do. Yeah, and it's a it's a condemnation of individualism of, of the liberal tradition, like right? you know that that if there are people out there who are saying something that is outside of what people are supposed to think, those people have to be forcibly condemned, uh, and in some cases with uh, you know with the use of violence. And so, as far as that uh, as that is concerned, so the big the big crime there after Charlottesville was he didn't come down and tell people what to think. Which one thing that when I've you know when I was looking at what was going on with Brexit, you know, you saw how Brexit passed by a very yeah. slim majority, and I've I've thought to myself, uh, you know, and I think out loud before that really David Cameron's government when they mailed things out telling people to vote for remain when they said what? here's the government's position here's what you should think here's what we want you to do I right. think that that's what lost it. I think that if they had not tried to tell people how to think and how to vote, and if Cameron's government had just allowed a free election, that it might have turned out differently. Because, you know, I, th I think that people are naturally resentful when they see authorities right. tell them, you know, you need to think this way. And if you're thinking about this, you're wrong. If you're concerned about immigration, you're wrong or you're wrong and you're racist. And that's really the dangerous thing that we're seeing here is, you know, and I think that Americans naturally condemn racism because we see that that is, I mean, we can't really have a country that's as ethnically diverse as the United States functionally and be racist at the same time, that, that it's just, it's not good for our society. And, you know, so most Americans shy away from this, but then when it's just this very forcible condemnation, I mean, I, I've seen it in, in some young people that I see, you know, some young people are starting to get into this just because they're not supposed to, like that it's the ultimate taboo. And so it's like almost the new sort of punk rock or something like that for rebellious, uh, for rebellious kids. Whereas if we had a more open society, less people would be seduced by these sorts of viewpoints. Well, uh, look, I, I, as you can hear, I, I, I'm a Yankee, as you call us, <laughs> and uh, I won't get out my New York Yankees cap, but I went to college in the South, in uh, Alabama, University of Montevallo. Anyone from Montevallo, you know, you wouldn't expect it, but I'm an alum. And I have to say, you know, having a, both a North and South experience, I went, to I went to graduate school at Johns Hopkins in Baltimore, border state, halfway in between. And I have to say, I, I, I felt that in the South, in Alabama, people had had to reckon with racism. They knew they had a racist past, right? They knew there was slavery in Alabama. And on campus at University of Montevallo, now, you know, I'm not black. I can't tell you the subjective experience of black students, but I can tell you that it felt like people were aware of that past and people accounted for it and people were sensitive about it, which is really important. Whereas in the North, I think there's much more casual racism in the North. Because in the North, everyone can just say, well, of course, I'm a Northerner, I'm not racist. And then they can go ahead and act as racist as they want. And I think that's a lesson also in the US and overseas. So if I tell you that the US is much less racist than Australia or Germany, most people think you're crazy. Look at all the race problems we have in the United States. I said, no, 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 we have race problems big quotes, if anyone's listening instead of watching, big quotes around problems. We have racial problems because we engage with issues of race and racism. We talk about it, we confront it. Uh, in Australia, in Europe, it's in Japan, certainly in Asia, it's just swept under the carpet. Right? They haven't yet come to terms with the racism that, let's face it, pretty much all of us have you know, deep in our hearts somewhere, some kind of racial judgment that we judge people based on how we see them. But in America, we come to terms with that. We know that that's wrong, right? We fight that impulse. You know, we're aware of our language. You know, we're aware of how other people feel. And although talking to mostly Americans on this podcast, you may think that America is, you know, torn apart by racial divide. You know, go to Germany and listen to what Germans say in English about black people. I won't use the terms <laughs> that they use because, you know, Americans will be shocked the terms I've heard about Jews in Australia, I mean, being from New York, I'm very sensitive to anti-Semitism and anti-Semitic language, even when it's not meant in a negative way. Here in Australia, you hear it all the time. 
right? Because they've not become aware. They haven't started to think about it. And I think in the South in the U.S., I mean, every white person in the South who wants to keep a Confederate monument on a pedestal is very aware of the racial issues involved, is very aware of the Civil War, is very aware of the heritage of slavery, has really thought about it. And I think that's what we really want. Well, you know, to get back to we're talking about independent thinking, what we want in society, in a de democratic society, is people who've thought about the issues and come to a decision. We may not agree with their decision, but we want to know that they're aware of it, that they've thought about it. And you know, I'll tell you, in the 20, 2018 election, those midterm elections, more people had really thought about what they want from their candidates than in any midterm election in the last century, right? Because populism brought all these battles to the front. They made people think about it, made people think about their candidates. You know, most people couldn't have named their House of Representatives representative two years ago. You know what, now they can, <laughs> because it was all you know, brought to the front. And that's what we really need, that's what we want in a democracy. You know, people tell me, oh, America's more divided than ever. I say, no, 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 it's fantastic. People are engaged more than ever in politics, more than in the last 100 years. And that's a fantastic thing. That's what populism has done for America. Okay, and see, that's you, you've actually kind of preempted me because, you know, in your book here, uh, you know, you're, you're talking about uh, populism and not so much populism as a destination, you know, populism. And, and that's one thing that people, you know, had been confused about, you know, and of course, when I told people in, in 2016, I voted for Donald Trump, I've said that I was voting for Donald Trump. And of course, you know, people are like, oh, well, you're a smart guy. How come you're not smart enough to see that, uh, you know, Trump is bad and that sort of thing? Thing. And I, you know, and I, I told people, you know, we have a two party system. We have an adversarial political process and you have to you have to pick. And, you know, I, I've told somebody before, this is not what I want long term for the United States, but the Republican Party of John McCain and Mitt Romney, you know, it had been stale. It's just it was out of touch right. and it needed, as you call, some type of, uh, of purgative uh, to kind of animate it again. You know, I've, I've said, you know, I mean, people shouldn't look at, um, you know, Do Republicans shouldn't look at Donald Trump as Jesus. You know, he's John the Baptist <laughs> at best, you know, possibly, you know, heralding something that could come along that would be better. But that's, you know, what I'm hearing from you right now is that we already see that even though right now it just seems like we're in the middle of a bunch of muck and it's toxic and I mean I even thought about not voting in the 2018 yeah. election I ended up voting because people uh, you know people made some credible arguments for that uh, now of course I ran into that uh, sort of mentality you're talking about because there were some people that when I said that I, I was I wasn't planning to vote. There were people who said, oh, I'm never showing his videos in my classroom again. You know, it was this very know, like authoritarian, like how dare he say that he's not voting. But then there were plenty of other people that said, hey, why don't you consider this and let's have a discussion about this and let's have an exchange of ideas. And I was so touched by that that I changed my mind. And but what we're seeing here even though the atmosphere is toxic, uh, we're seeing like for decades, people have been complaining about a decrease in political participation. Like if we look back at the 50s and 60s and before that, we see turnout that's way above what we've seen right. recently. And so right. what uh, what we see here is what Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump and candidates like this have done. Uh, they've told people that, you know, hey, like, why don't you come back out and get involved in the process? I mean, I remember in 2012, uh, they were talking about, uh, you know, seven million white voters who had voted in 2008, uh, you know, and then they just, and some of them, many of them for Obama, it wasn't just white voters who had right. voted for John McCain, but some who had voted for Obama, but they talked about like there were 7 million white voters who for whatever reason in 2012 didn't vote. And right. so, you know, what you're seeing among all, and then of course, what we've seen, you know, over the last couple of years is an increase in the 
uh, African-American share of the electorate with the recent uh, election in Alabama. You saw in Georgia, uh, you know, that was a very close election that happened just now. So, you know, so the thing is, what I'm hearing from you is that we're already seeing as a result of this shakeup, we're seeing right. more political participation, more engagement. Now, what are some other things? Because I'm getting the vibe, uh, Salvatore, that you're kind of optimistic about the future and you see this oh, very as something that was that was needed. So where do you see this going? Oh, well, first of all, like, we only had a, a, a half transition in 2016. If we had had a Trump-Sanders election, you would have had a Republican Republican representing the views of Republicans against a Democratic Democrat representing the views of the Democrats. You would have had a conservative versus a progressive, and I think you would have had a just a landslide of people coming to the polls. Uh, now, the Democratic Party effectively quashed the Sanders campaign, and what we ended up with was a reformed Republican Party. I mean, no Republican Party leader will ever again take the electorate for granted, or at least not for the next 20, 30 years, not for a generation. In the Democratic Party, there's still that half transition. And we're going to see in the 2020 primaries whether the Democratic Party reforms itself and starts taking the opinions of its voters seriously or whether it continues to quash them. I mean, look at something like, like the, the Trans-Pacific Partnership as a litmus test issue. You know, Bernie Sanders was against it as a progressive. Donald Trump was against it as a conservative. Hillary Clinton was in favor of it until it became clear that people were against it. <laughs> and so she became sort of against it. But, you know, we all know, I mean, everyone at Foreign Affairs Magazine, where I publish, you know, knows that if Clinton had won the election, she would have tweaked the Trans-Pacific Partnership and then signed it, right? No problem, okay? What we need in the 2020 election is a conservative Republican versus a progressive Democrat, a Sanders type, and then we'll see people coming to the polls in droves. Look. I'm a conservative, I'm a progressive, and I'm a liberal. We have these three great traditions in America, and frankly, I think they're all great traditions. It's just that sometimes we get too much of one or too much of the other. You know, and I think for the last 50, 60, 70 years, liberals have taken over both parties. You know, both parties have been run by people who pretty much have a consensus for free trade, for increased uh, increased uh, rights for uh, for minorities, uh, for uh, an ACLU sort of a American Civil Liberties Union view of the world, and that's become so dominant that what we need is to pull that back a bit. Right? Let's have some real progressivism. Let's have some real conservatism. That's what's going to change things. But I want to say before we end the video, you know, I really want to say for the record, I'm not against Trump. I mean, personally. I think Trump's foreign policy has been 100% successful. I mean, living outside the U.S. and seeing foreign policy in action in Asia and in Europe, I think it's just been incredibly successful. Trump's trade policy, I agree with 99%. Now, when you get to domestic policy, no, the Trump tax cuts, I was not in favor of. Uh, I would like to see a more progressive taxation system with richer people paying higher taxes. Deregulation of the environment, I'm not in favor of it. I would like to see cleaner water and cleaner air in America, right? So his language, no, I don't agree with Trump's language. I think that he, you know, sometimes doesn't remember that he's president of the United States when he's tweeting late at night, okay? So there's some things I agree with, some things I disagree with. I don't think Trump is a necessary evil that we're somehow tolerating in order to make the system better. I think on balance, Trump's been a better president than most of our presidents, you know, since maybe Ronald Reagan. Now, not the greatest of all time, but, you know, a pretty good president. Uh, you know, I'm pretty much in favor of him. I would vote for him to be reelected in 2020. Uh, that said, the important thing is not who's president, right? We've had presidents come and go. I mean, you, you know, everyone thought, everyone I know thought it was the end of the world when George Bush was elected. <laughs> I mean, you're old enough to remember the panic, people saying, I'm going to move to Canada because I can't live in the same country where George W. Bush is the president. And now George W. Bush is the elder statesman who people look to to, you know, provide stability. <laughs> Oh yeah, my goodness! So I, I'm so glad I'm not the only person who remembers that. I mean, because the hey. thing is, like, when George H. W. Bush's funeral, uh, you know, and then he speaks there, and it's like, yeah, that George W. Bush isn't Donald Trump, and so he's good. But then, you know, I was explaining to my students that 
back in the day, Bush did 9-11 wasn't a meme that people laughed at. Like it was actually, you know, there were people who really uh, had it out for the guy. And there's some of the same people who today are praising how, oh, yeah, what a great statesman he is and that sort of thing. So, so yeah, the acrimony is definitely not something that is new. I think it's just we've got new ways to express that. You know, imagine if social media had been around like when Bush, uh, you know, <laughs> Was what was president, uh, you know? You but it really the show the yeah. American president. They yeah, had an entire really, TV show making fun of Bush. Yeah, and it really had, you know, as far as far as that goes, it's going to be interesting looking back to see what happens, uh, what happens here. And and I guess for me, you know, being a, uh, you know, really, I, I consider myself a right wing liberal, uh, you know, when I'm, uh, you know, when I'm cornered, and really in terms of having a two party system in the United States, and that, you know, philosophically, we really don't have much of an anchor. I just, I just felt like the Republican Party needed some sort of renewal uh and maybe our, you know because it's gotten to where i mean hopefully at some point uh you know i would like as a republican to see a republican nominee who represents the party as a whole and who right. has the ability to represent the american people as a whole and when it comes down to it i just you know john mccain mitt romney uh you know they they just didn't they didn't have that and so right. i'm hopeful that you know down the road you know we will as as you mentioned here uh, that we go back to the gettysburg address and the principles there that you know our government is not supposed to be a government of some of the people for some of the people and right, by right. some of the people and although trump is a polarizing figure i think that you know at least maybe we can have these uh you know these discussions and maybe there you know it is refreshing i think part of the reason i wanted you to come on here uh tonight and chat about this is that you do have an optimistic uh, viewpoint and i think that right. that's uh, that that's something that that people need to hear um Tell me, like, you know, while but before we wrap up, like, tell yeah. me what what kind of president? Let me just this is kind of an off the cuff question, Salvatore. Yeah, yeah, um, but sure. let's let's fast forward to, um, you know, 2032. You know, that's enough time for Kanye <laughs> to have done. Kanye could have done two terms by then. Yeah, uh, yeah. You know, we're not talking about anybody in politics right now. But tell me what kind of America what, might we be looking at in 2032 if this populist purgative has, you know, had its ability to run its course and we get on the right track. What does America look like in 2032? What I'm really hoping is that we get some, a new era of progressive reform. You know, I'm on the far, you know, in terms of 1896 progressives, I'm Dr. Progressive, right? So what I want is an elected Supreme Court. I don't think that's going to happen, but I've advocated for it. Uh, you know, I would like more engagement in elections. And I would like more responsive public policy. You know, the average American hasn't received a raise in 50 years now. Right? The, the economy has doubled GDP per capita. Average wages have been stagnant. And not just for whites, they've been stagnant for blacks. And they've been stagnant for women in the same profession. So women's wages have risen because women have entered new professions. But for women who are working in any particular profession, you know, elementary school teachers' wages in 1972, elementary school teachers' wages today, same, right? So we've had, we, we need a new progressive era. And the way we're going to get that new progressive era is by getting people into politics, right? We need people to, we need politics to be responsive to what people want. And frankly, I think what people want is a mixture of traditional Republican policies. Remember, Republicans were traditionally for America first, were traditionally for isolationism, were traditionally for benefiting American industry, not free trade. That's the traditional Republican position. And I'd like to see a combination of that and the traditional Democratic Party position, which was for rising wages, which was for antitrust regulation, uh, which was for higher taxes on higher earners. You know, I'd like to see us return to the 19th, early 20th century balance of American politics with progressives and conservatives battling it out and liberals as a kind of referee between them, making sure that people's rights are respected, um, but not necessarily running the show. And you've been very kind to plug the book. I'm going to take a moment to plug the book. Um, the New Authoritarianism, 
uh, Trump Populism and the Tyranny of Experts, I'm going to plug it to your audience in particular because this is not a book about today's elections. This is a history book. This book is full of American history. You mentioned several times government of the people, by the people, for the people. I tell the story in the book of how that was originally, in the abolitionist literature, government of all the people, by all the people, for all the people. And once you realize it that way, it starts to make a lot more sense. You know, Lincoln had a great way of putting things, but then people have wondered for 150 years, what does he mean by of the people? Well, when you realize of all the people, that means everyone has to be included in our political arena, including African-Americans, which at the time was an abolitionist, you know, the, the, the whole purpose of abolition was to bring African-Americans into the community. Um, government of all the people, by all the people, everyone should be engaged in the political debate. And for all the people, government should benefit everyone, not just a small class. And I think government of the people, by the people, for the people, represents conservatism. Remember, it was the Republicans who wanted abolition, not the Democrats, right? It was the Republicans who, uh, Abraham Lincoln was a Republican, not a Democrat. Government of all the people means the nation as a whole. It's that, you know, that romantic thinking back to us all as one people is a very conservative point of view. Government by all the people is the liberal principle that we have to ensure that everyone has the right to vote, that everyone can participate. There are no barriers, there are no Jim Crow laws. And then government for all the people is the progressive mantra, that government should benefit everybody, not just a small class. So I see that original phrase, and I, and I, you know, I go through the history in the book of where the phrase comes from, how it was picked up by Lincoln. And throughout this book, you'll find a lot of Lincoln, you'll find a lot of the Federalists versus the Anti-Federalists. If you want, I know you love going back to the, the Federalists and the, and the constitutional debates. You'll find a lot of the 1896 progressive movement. You'll find a lot of Roosevelt and how liberal came to be renamed as someone who wanted free markets to someone who believed in racial equality. And you'll find that redefinition of liberal by Franklin Roosevelt. And then, of course, we'll bring it forward to Trump today. OK, yeah. And, you know, it's, it's interesting because there are some things, of course, as somebody who studies history and it's something that no, nothing's really set in stone. There are a few things that I'm like, wait, is he calling Hamilton a liberal or something like that? But Absolutely. on another note, I want to say, Salvatore, that there's one thing that I got out of this book because, you know, I've got a natural tendency to want to just fact check everything. And you yeah. said something about Woodrow Wilson um, having this America first slogan. America first. Like, well, let me look at that. And the thing is, the way that like the the version of history that we all get is Woodrow Wilson's the internationalist and all of a sudden here comes Warren G. Harding with America first and sure enough when I went in and uh, you know just checked behind you Woodrow Wilson's 1916 campaign used the slogan America first. And, and that's something that I think that we can kind of go with here uh, just in closing, because what I really like about your message is you're talking about how America is shaped by conservatism, liberalism, progressivism, and everybody has contributed to what America is, and it doesn't have to be adversarial. So even though a lot of times we fall into oversimplifying history that, you know, the whole idea of America first, this was something that you saw from Wilson and from Harding. Now, they may have had different interpretations of what uh, goes into that, but it is something that I think is worth uh, reflecting on. And that's something I'm very thankful for your book because, you know, it's showing how it's not always so so cut and dry. It's almost reminds me of reading some of Richard Hofstetter's work, uh, you know, which kind of goes into, you He's know, in the book into, too. huh? He's in the book too. Okay, yeah, and, and the thing is, as far as uh, as far as Hofstetter's work, you know, he's really going into how a lot of times the opposite sides are really pursuing the same kind of thing, and you know what what you seem to be looking for in some ways is almost like another Teddy Roosevelt square deal, uh, where you know, and Teddy Roosevelt kind of brought it to everybody's attention that, like, look, before him, when there was a strike, then the government came down on the side of business, and you know, against the strikers. And Teddy Roosevelt said, no, I, I'm going to invite both sides to the White House because everybody should have a chance to be heard. And this should be some this should be a negotiation and not a win or lose kind of thing where it's a government of some of the some of the people and for some of the people 
against others. And so I think that's a very promising message is perhaps there is a future for the United States of America that, you know, is a future for everybody in this country and not just the whole trading, uh, you know, trading uh, slugs between political factions. Look, Barack Obama said there's no black America and no white America. I'm going to remind you, there's no Democratic America and Republican America. There's only one America. And, you know, we're all patriots on all sides of this political debate. All right. And thank you very much, uh, Salvatore Babonis, again, the author of The New Authoritarianism, Trump, Populism, and the Tyranny of Experts. And as you've heard us talk about this, uh, you know, it's it's not just about Trump or the election, but it really has a lot of things to offer uh, about where things are going now. And especially as an educator, as somebody who teaches history, uh, very appreciative. And Salvatore, hopefully I'll have you on here again sometime and talk about some other stuff. This has been a great chat. Oh, we'd love to. Thanks. Hey, and hey, best politics book of 2018, Wall Street Journal. Yes, yes, I saw. Yes, definitely. And that was uh, that was a good one. I'm glad, honored to have you on here. And thank you so much again. And everyone, thank you all for watching. It is always a pleasure.